introduction we made earlier this morning about a kind of variety of voices coming here today. When Lucy and I organized the conference, we thought really long and hard about how to organize it. And within our organization, and certainly within organizations that we work with, there are a variety of opinions about the and about sex work. And they're very divisive and they're very pretentious. Uh, for us, we, we made a decision to just include sex positive voices in terms of choreography and to include sex positive voices. And that doesn't mean that we don't understand or value other voices, but actually, in the space of a one day conference, considering the degree of contentiousness and divisiveness, we didn't think that we could achieve anything. However, we are considering running a longer event, doing events that might actually engage more voices and that we might actually be able to find some kind of common ground rather than simply attacking one another. So we'll keep you up to date if we do organize something longer and certainly we would like to hear more voices and different voices on this issue. But for today, we felt trying to keep the agenda focused um, and trying to have discussions around these issues was really important. So a big thank you to Catherine Stevens and to Ava Caradonna for the amazing presentations this morning. Uh, we'll come back to some of these issues in the round table this afternoon. So, street-based sex work, uh, slightly different. Ava talked a bit about the, the struggles that street-based sex workers face, and I'll be talking a bit more about that. Pete Middleton is here from the Women's Open Spaces Project, and he'll be telling you a bit about Women's Open Spaces. So what I wanted to do today was take some of the research that we did. Uh, it wasn't necessarily about sex work, it was about the Women's Open Spaces Project, and sex workers contributed their own views to how they got the organization around. So this was an evaluation, it was a project that looked at the Women's Open Spaces and the services they delivered. So in this presentation I'm going to argue that um, the criminalization of clients employing the Swedish model would further marginalize women who are already marginalized. It would further problematize working conditions for women who already face lots of problems working in the streets. Um, so the key aim of the evaluation was to look at the uh, look at the services offered by women's open spaces, focusing on their service delivery and looking at how they worked as an organization, trying to establish some areas of best practice with engaging with street press, street based sex workers in London and King's Cross. So, I'll let Pete tell you a bit about the Women's Open Spaces Project. Um, yeah, uh, I work for an organization called New Horizon Youth Centre, which is based in uh, King Cross, uh, Houston area. Uh, we've been working with homeless young people since 1967. So, we're a project set by a guy called Lord Longford, who works with a lot of uh, uh, people in prison, he's dead now. And um, he famous or work with Myra Hindley, which is obviously why everyone hates him or likes him or whatever, but actually he did a lot of work with uh, marginalized people. So in the 1967 he set up a, a youth project for homeless young people in central London in a church, um, I don't know what place it need, a crypt on the church. And uh, we moved eventually, anyway, in 1994 up to uh, King's Cross, where I started working in 1995. And uh, still been working there ever since, uh, for my sins. And uh, the project we've set up uh, that, that's there is was work specifically with young people. So our job was well, meet young people in the street. Was my job and my forework at the time. Uh, bring those young people into the New Horizon, work about getting them into housing, look at their um, activities that they do on the street. We didn't call it antisocial at the time, we just called it criminal activity. What did we get antisocial in the late 1990s when Labour got to power? And uh, the, uh, that sort of stuff got them to uh, address their issues around um, work, around getting them into training, peace, not in education and training employment, etc. And uh, so that's what we were doing. What we found, though, was that to actually get this group of young people who were a bit more hidden than uh, just like, you know, finding a young person like yourself out the street, approaching that person, trying to find out how you're sleeping rough, except if they were actually physically sleeping rough, there was no way of knowing. So what we did was we would talk to the older clients out the street. Those older clients, as you, a lot of people here probably won't know that, but some people will hear though that King's Cross had a huge sex work, drug prostitution issue since the 19th century, and it has been 
all the way through that time uh, it had been that area had been known for it. And uh, so we decided to make a, an effort of working with the women. Now, this is nothing to do with our project, but because of my co-worker and myself, uh, my co-worker came from a sex worker project, and the two of us decided that we would engage with the women, uh, specifically because they're there all the time. They were working there on the street corners, and we went out there in the daytime, they were there on the street corners, they were there at nighttime. And so they were more likely to, uh, to be there. Outside, the only other people who would know most would be the police, but uh, the police were chasing young people, and the women around them weren't really that bothered with the young people. The women were actually the better option, and some of the men as well. Uh, we decided to work with them. We call our project the way we in, uh, did it was called snowballing. In other words, we give somebody, whatever age they are, a service, whether it's making sure they're um, getting a sexual health check, getting them into housing, something, even though they weren't in our age group, we did all that. We would then get our target group, which was young people, which were between 21 and underage, like down to 12, 12 13. So we, we did that, we were very successful, and that went all the way through the 90s, and by the end of about 2000, we realized that there was actually very little young people in King's Cross on the street. Uh, we were so quick, we were so good, we had actually become that brilliant at engaging with the young people, that a young person, once they hit the street, within two or three days, either the women or even some of the men would have that young person at our door. We wouldn't even have to go look for them. They would just drag them down there. And come on, you got to come to the horizon and then we engage. And hopefully, not in every case, but in most cases, they would be made to uh, go off into another life cycle that was not street based. I mean, it was a good life cycle. It might have got a job in the city. Who knows? I Oh, what I'm trying to say is that they actually went off and did something positive and went off and did something positive in their life. And that's not saying that everything that is positive in life. But you know what I mean? They, they did what they felt was positive. And some, a lot of them came back and talked about it. And some are volunteering now at New Horizon or even more people. Um, anyway, in 2001, we set up the Walls Project, which uh, here we did a, uh, about two years ago, did a, a uh, evaluation of our project. and made some recommendations and we took them all on board and we have took on all, all of the recommendations that we had probably seen probably ourselves what we are doing probably right if you know what I mean we hadn't looked at ourselves too much. So our project basically set up uh, mainly because um, uh, I had lived up a lot as a man, a heterosexual male, working on the streets, I had built up a big relationship with a lot of women which was um, not the usual sort of thing that uh, most women's projects like doing is having a man involved. But anyway, we, we did ask the site that this was a positive thing because of two things. One, that, that some women relate better to men than to other women. So much as like uh, an idea that a women's project that all women will talk to each other, some women, well, the women I've been dealing with a lot in the street, have a better relationship with men for some reason. I don't know why, it's maybe that this abusive relationship that they've been through, that they have, uh, have made it easy for them to talk to men. I don't know. Secondly, uh, being a, uh, having a male in the project or having some men in the project engaging with some of their partners means that, that you can actually divert, stop the men from stopping the women to attend the project. Because if you actually deal with the partner, the partner, uh, sometimes it can be women, but mostly men, uh, you can actually deal with uh, maybe uh, get him in, into a place, get him sort of a substance abuse issue or whatever issues that he has. Um, sometimes maybe even <laughs> grass and muck and get them licked, but that would be you know, an abuser. Like uh, sometimes that is a better option for the woman, uh, and that, that, that has worked as well. Uh, in one particular case, I managed to get a woman back to Ireland. After three years of engagement with the woman on the street, she never talked to me, so it was to be bigger to figure out what was going on. The police were able to target him, he got arrested, and then she started talking to us. And then we were actually able to help her out and get her back, uh, get the engagement with the services and get her back to the thing. So sometimes that's a better option. But that was only a very specific one. But mostly it's around just engaging with the man, getting him a service, allowing the woman to use the service. And usually those relationships do split apart. Not all the time, but most times they do split apart because the woman goes off uh, probably wants something else, the man goes off doing something else, they go apart. 
Um, and then eventually, we've done all that. We uh, saw a thing with that all very small, and it, uh, it expanded. And then we were dealing with up to 30 women a session. Uh, basically, every sex worker in King's Cross was attending our level. Everyone had a sexual health checkup. We got everybody into our them into housing as we could at the hostels. Got them on substance misuse programs. Uh, engaged them around counselling. Engaged them around uh, building up their their self awareness and giving them options. Uh, we don't. We never mentioned exiting. Matter of fact, it wasn't even anybody talking about exiting back in 2001 or until about 2006 or seven, the people started talking about exiting. But around that specific time, we were actually just talking about, is there any other options? Is there something else you want to do? Because the vast majority of the women I worked with, even when they came off uh, their heroin, usually the vast majority of them were on heroin, some were on heroin and crack, a uh, smaller amount were on crack only. They, uh, and alcohol was always an issue with the vast majority of them. Uh, they came, once they came off, uh, they were still in poverty. They're still only on benefits. Uh, matter of fact, getting them onto benefits was the hardest thing because if you try, if you're a worker and you're earning a sex worker working on the street, and you're earning 500 quid a week, but all of that, most of that's going on your substance misuse issue. Uh, you you try to actually convince a woman to sign up for 40 pound or you know, 80 pound every two or 100 pound whatever every two weeks. It's, it's really hard, like, you know what I mean? They'd have to go through the hoops to get to that benefits. Uh, and, but you, you do over a period of time and, 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 and they see the better options. And it's the first thing with most people with substance issues issues, and that, that includes men as well, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an issue. But they, what happens then is women, they start courses, they may start engaging with their families, they may finally get back with their, their some sort of engagement with their children, um, but they're still on a very limited uh, amount of money because if you put somebody in a hospital, even though health benefits pays the vast majority of the bill, out of the, the person's benefits, they might have to pay 20 pounds. So like if they're left with 30 quid to survive for a week, so you try to survive in London on 30 pounds a week, it just doesn't happen, like, you know what I mean? Even a few years ago, it doesn't happen. The transfer, so the women will work. Then, as labour became something out of a 1984 war Orwellian film, and more and more cameras went up, and antisocial behaviour became the catch cry, and antisocial behaviour orders became the catch cry of everything in King's Cross, and we were involved in the and meetings that were called targeted tasking, very nice meetings, uh, which had involved police, community safety, outreach teams, that is, uh, the, anybody you can think of was there, they were all sitting on the table and we talked about people like they were non-entities, and we got like people who are street wardens to uh, try to show you pictures of women having sex, <coughs> which was obscene, and we explained to them that why, you know, we, we know they're sex workers, so, why are you actually showing them that they're actually doing something wrong? What exactly are they, you know, I mean, I'm as in doing the sexual act wrong, and like, you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, And we have to explain that to them why they're doing it wrong. Uh, there's actually nothing we can actually do here uh, because we still think they're sex workers, so them performing an act doesn't do that for us, like, you know what I mean? It's, it might do something for them, because we're men, and they were obviously getting titillated by it. Uh, it was a weird sort of scenario. So we went through that got through all that and uh, then we decided that this um, antisocial behaviour sort of stuff, because uh, initially when the antisocial behaviour came in, it was not, sex workers were definitely not going to be targeted, that was the definite thing, we're going to target drug dealers, uh, and once they targeted all the drug dealers, the sex workers were next, like, you know, so it was, uh, they were all targeted. So we uh, went through a whole process of that. But um, the funny thing is, like, I'm a history student, so um, my, my degree was in my wonderful uh, degree was in history, uh, world history, and uh, I like studying stuff like world history, so I read some books of, when I got involved in this area, I started reading books about the history of prostitution in London. And amazingly enough, since the 1550s, there have been loads of different times when there's been campaigns to legalize or make it, uh, to criminalize prostitution in, in London. Huge campaigns, really, really, really significantly horrible ones, like compared to today, like, you know, 
like groups of these ones, like you know, concentration camps sort of ideas of dealing with women back in the, those times in, in London. And within a few years later, it was seen that it didn't work because people who are involved in this sort of activity, uh, whether it's the men who are want to go with the women or the women who are uh, involved in, the, in, the, in, the, in prostitution, sex working, they, they find ways around it because the system is inflexible. It, only, it, it can only see what sees right now. So when, it, when the laws are brought in, they only see what, they're like square. And no matter how they try and change, they can't change it because the law is square, so you have to change the law each time. To, so every time something happens to change it, they have to do it. So when, when something is made illegal, all that happens is they go over there. So the women just go, all right, we can't have to do antisocial behavior, and the men are like, that's the mean, it's fine, like saying they're going to criminalize the men. They already are criminalizing the men. Because they've got loads of operations that they do all the time um, in, in around King's Cross with the target the men who are going around here in cars or whatever, curb crawling or walking around, whatever. They do do it all the time. So this is happening already. So what the women do is they know the regular punters, they get their phone numbers, and they just text them when they're in town. And they text each other and they say, oh, I'm in town, blah, 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 beat up, blah, blah, that's it. They go online, they find other ways around the system. And, and they continue on. And it, it, it's, they meet bars. Uh, a lot of our women who used to be, probably wouldn't have got into bars in the old days, like now have managed to make themselves look a lot better because we have managed to get them off the street and into programs. They're looking a lot better. They go to bars, meet up with the men, etc. So there's always a way around anybody who sets a law and puts a square and says, the woman, this is what it is, or the man, this is what he should do. They would just. They go like, well, that's the square I'll stand over here. Like, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything because laws are there to avoid. As we can see, when you look at bigger pictures like bankers in the city and regulations, because what they do is the government set up regulations, and the bankers just go, well, the regulations are there, I'll just stand over here and I'll make my deals on the side and bring down the whole world. <laughs> or do I actually look at a very vulnerable group of people? And can I actually do something positive for them? And that's what I see uh, is uh, what we try to do is do the positive things, engaging. It has taken time, and, and we, we used to not really do much of uh, counselling. Counselling used to be the one thing we said, don't open this kind of worms. A woman has, so rightly say, like you know, some women have been abused since they're being children, and have had to keep that, on, you know, good Catholic guild stuff, keep it, because I'm from a very Catholic background. The main thing you do is you do, never talk about your problem, especially as a man. You keep it all inside you, you build it up, and the only way you can actually express it is by going down to the pub, having a few beers, and probably getting into a silly fight about something that's actually nothing to do with this, but like, you know, you do something stupid. Or do you have counseling? And so we've decided that uh, the last few years, is that a way of actually getting women to express what's actually going on in their lives, is to have some sort of, if they want, have some sort of counselling around those sort of issues uh, that they, they may want to talk about. And it may not be the, the whole history, it may be about the specific thing about rape or sexual abuse or about why people are rejecting them uh, because of their lifestyle <laughs> or stuff like that. But it, there's lots of issues, myriad of issues that they may, may be they want counselling around. Uh, we make sure there's always a meal, they always have dinner. We make sure that they have uh, presents at Christmas. We open Christmas Day so that women can come in, they have somewhere they can go that they know that there's, um, uh, and it mixes with our young people when you open Christmas Day, and it's actually quite nice because there's a sort of feeling a lot of the, the women are mothers, but they may not have any kids. Their kids have been all put in care, but actually our younger guys and girls, they can mix a lot better. And it's, it's quite nice, uh, nice to see. Um, I'd say that uh, outside that, really, like it's, uh, we just continue on doing it. We keep on, keep on working every night. We work four, excuse me, four nights a week. Uh, we also work on Sundays now, and uh, it's uh, it's a sort of a, it's reaching out there. It's 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 uh, making sure that the those sort of um, issues that are Having swept under the table for a long time with the street-based women, and funny enough, now we're, we're finding that uh, more women who are 
come from um, who have been working in indoors are now starting to use our services as well. But that's been because of poverty and homelessness and not having legal status in the country, so they can't access anything like uh, benefits or anything like that. Like that. So they're coming to use our services. So, so that's this is a way of actually uh, they can get some food, uh, access to the internet, training, etc. Music. We've got a wonderful music um, tutorial studio, which seems to be the only thing that <coughs> everybody seems to be queuing up to do all the time, and it's, it's really nice. Um, and stuff like that. You know. So um, that's basically what the project does. Um, Probably the amount of 95% of it, but that's basically uh, what I can think of the moment. Oh, yeah, sorry, I, I, I only got told last night about half five that I was doing this. Sorry. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> very kindly put up with Lucy and I for a number of months while we uh, did lots and lots of different things with them, <coughs> uh, participatory observations at the drop-ins. We did outreach walks with Pete and the outreach team, so actually went out doing outreach walks as they went around engaging with uh, a number of clients on the streets. We also did in-depth in interviews with the Women's Open Spaces team. With the women who came to the drop-in who wanted to come and participate, they gave their <coughs> fully informed consent. So important. So we spoke to women, the sex working women, about their experiences in women's open spaces, and we spoke to some of the young women at New Horizons and uh, a number of other third sector and public sector organizations. I know that there's a variety of people here. Some of I can see some of my students. Aisha's here. I've seen, I've seen a few others. Aisha. Uh, and I know that some of you have a really, really in-depth knowledge of, of prostitution and sex work, and some of you have very little knowledge at all. So I just wanted to spend a little time talking about street-based sex work specifically. Um, and actually just talk about the vulnerability of street-based sex workers, um, particularly because they face high levels of violence. Um, within the UK, sex workers uh, often report violence when working on the streets. And sex workers are 12 times more likely to die from violence at work than women their own age. So Tila Sanders um, and Rose Campbell argue that street-based sex workers face higher levels of violence uh, as women who experience the most vulnerable social and economic status are least likely to have recall to physical safety strategies and are therefore more, more exposed to violence. Um, and in King's Crosses, as it's said um, sex workers have been targeted specifically, and curb calling programs have targeted clients of sex workers. So there's been lots of talk recently about criminalizing clients, and as Pete said, that's already been happening here. So you can actually see while we were doing the evaluation some of the effects of this. And that's what I want to talk about today, really, is to think about if we bring in a Swedish-style model of regulating or controlling prostitution, what impact might that have on women working in this industry? And I'll only think about the women that we spoke to and their experiences. I can't speak for all sex workers, I can't speak for any other street-based sex workers other than the ones that we spoke to. But I can think about how further criminalization of clients might impact the way that they work and how it might increase their vulnerability as they get pushed into more marginal spaces and more vulnerable terms. So I will just say, even though we had a few recommendations for the Women's Open Spaces Project, by and large, the women who we spoke to felt indebted to women's open spaces because it was a safe space for them to visit. They felt like normal people, they didn't feel stigmatized, they had a place that they could go to where they felt free of stigma. And for them, this is one of the overwhelming sort of feelings that they put across to us, is that finally they had a space where stigma wasn't part of how they interacted with people. They talked about a few things in particular that I think are relevant in relation to the Swedish model. They talked about safety on the streets, they talked about their vulnerability in different ways, and they talked about feelings of isolation and marginalization. Um, and we thought about the particular organizational approach that Women's Open Spaces took towards their clients. They have a very holistic model of working with clients. They use harm reduction. Exiting isn't their priority. If a woman wants to exit, of course they'll have that conversation with her, but it's not an agenda that they push. And so we looked at the evidence of best practice in terms of harm reduction and their outreach practices in this program. So most of the women that we spoke to felt that police were particularly problematic. They didn't feel safe talking to the police. Women's open spaces were advocates for them. 
to dealing with uh, community safety, we're dealing with police officers in this space. And one woman told us that she was actually increasingly scared of working on the streets, that she was facing increasing levels of violence. Um, she heard stories about stabbings. She was really nervous about working at night and about her safety in these spaces. And this is something that was echoed by a number of the sex workers that we spoke to. And I think it's important to ask why they feel more vulnerable in these spaces. And the overwhelming sense that we got is that they felt the potential for violence was exacerbated by a heightened police presence, that they were being targeted by police specifically, and that this was leading them to work in different ways. So rather than working in groups, uh, where women might have a kind of a sense of safety or a sense of protection from working in a community, they were no longer able to do that. They were working on their own, they were working on their own in ways that they hadn't had to do before, and this increases their vulnerability. Uh, one participant told us that she'd stopped speaking to other sex workers, so she wouldn't even have a conversation with another sex worker, because just the fact of having a conversation would make her a target for the police. So she wasn't even able to communicate with other sex workers on the street, and this is a strategy, certainly, that the UK and SWP make very clear this is one of the ways that sex workers can protect themselves. So this is a direct kind of, it's a direct contravention of the guidance around safety practices that street workers have access to. They can't protect themselves if they can't speak to one another, if they can't work in spaces that they know and that they're familiar with. So this increases their vulnerability. And it increases their vulnerability because the police are targeting them, not because their clients are making them more vulnerable, not because their clients are particularly violent, but because the police are increasing the sense of fear. Um, if we think about health and well-being, <coughs> as workers begin to work in more vulnerable spaces, as they begin to work in more marginal spaces, as they're targeted by police, they're less able to negotiate condom use. They're much less able to negotiate safe sex practices. So it's not just about their, their vulnerability to violence. It's also about their vulnerability to things like HIV and STIs. Um, Tila Sanders suggests that sex workers rarely have adequate support for mental health problems, and in particular that drug treatment services are not tailored for the needs of sex workers. So we spoke to a number of women who'd been in drug treatment problems, but because they had mental health problems as well, they were kicked out of the drug treatment program because they couldn't deal both with mental health issues or with the drug issues. And similarly, mental health, mental health organizations often aren't able to deal with drug-related issues. So you have women with really high level needs who really need support and who are seeking out support, but we don't have specialized service to actually help them. So women's open spaces actually became really important for, for them. Women, women's open spaces were able to negotiate for women, were able to try and find them services that might meet their needs. And this is really important for the women that we spoke to. So because women's open spaces operate a harm reduction approach to working with their client group, the women felt that this was really pragmatic, that this was a really helpful way of getting them to engage. Some of them felt that their lives had stabilized, not necessarily that they weren't using drugs, not that they weren't using heroin or crack, but maybe that they were using less, or they were using it in a way that was safer. So for them, it's not necessarily about exiting prostitution, it's not necessarily about stopping their drug problem, but about bringing some kind of stability to their lives, and they really valued this. This was really important. They really appreciated the holistic kind of uh, approach the women's open spaces to working with them. And outreach was fundamental to this process. So Lucy and I ended up doing miles and miles of outreach, and Pete does miles and miles of outreach every week. Uh, and actually, we were able to see when we went out with the outreach teams how important outreach was to engaging clients, building relationships. It, it was incredible to watch women's open spaces team deal with pretty much every person that they came across on the street. They knew them by name. If they didn't know them by name, they engaged them. And the outreach was really important. But they were also able to locate women on the streets. They knew where women were. Even though the, the women were working in different areas, they knew where these areas were because they had a lot of communication with women. If we think about the Swedish model and the particular approach that it uses to engaging or trying to, to solve the prostitution problem, there are three key legal elements that criminalize, prevent prostitution of all the adults. One is pandering, the forfeiture of rental apartments and rooms used for prostitution and the purchase of sex. Some of the implications of this particular approach is that harm reduction becomes more problematic. Because 
it's really difficult to understand exactly what we might define as encouraging prostitution, which is one of the kind of the keystones of the Swedish model. How do we how do we define what encouraging prostitution means? Does handing out condoms to a sex worker is that encouraging prostitution? That's really problematic. There's lots of different ways that we can define that, and actually, a harm reduction model can be more difficult to implement within a Swedish policy framework. Ability to negotiate safe sex, so it's already difficult for street-based sex workers to negotiate safe sex because drug problems for a lot of the women that we spoke to kind of impeded their ability to do so. But the Swedish, the Swedish model further discourages sex workers from using condoms and introduces tension and potentially violence between them and clients. This is from an article in the BMJ, the British Medical Journal. Uh, there are some real problems here with how sex workers might be able to negotiate, street-based sex workers in particular, how they'll be able to negotiate safe sex. Phil Hubbard argues that um, rather than resulting in a meaningful decrease of outdoor sex work, some evidence suggests that street sex work may be shifting to new, more marginal areas as, poli as police targets new, creating zones of exclusion. And this is certainly what we found with sex workers. <coughs> They knew areas that police were targeting, and they moved accordingly. But it meant that they moved to maybe a new borough that they hadn't worked in previously, that they even moved to a new street that they didn't know. Not having an awareness of the streets that they were working in and the zones that they were working in is really problematic. It decreases their ability to be able to negotiate a physical space. It decreases their ability to be able to be safe in these spaces. Other data suggests that sex workers may be using mobile phones and internet to meet clients, that this is the move that they're taking rather than kind of um, getting clients from curb crawling, that actually they're using mobile phones. Um, and actually, if you look at what's happening in Sweden, um, indoor sex work is becoming more and more prevalent as opposed to outdoor sex work as sex workers kind of change. And this is something that, that Pete said and something that we found in 2012 that sex workers that we spoke to were increasingly using mobile phones to contact clients. They weren't standing on the streets getting clients this way. They were using different technologies. So we can already see um, that there's this kind of shift to how women are working because of police presence and because they feel targeted in these particular areas. Um, so moving outdoor sex work indoors presents a number of problems. So because we talked about the importance of outreach and because outreach became a really significant element of how both of how was contacted women, but all, also how women engaged with women's open spaces. So women on the streets knew that women's open spaces would come around on a Monday or Thursday and they would often wait for them. It was often a they told us it was a bright spot in their night, you know, that they'd get, you know, a cup of coffee, they'd have a cigarette they'd have a conversation. They waited for the outreach teams to come. When you move these women indoors or off the streets, actually, services aren't able to engage with them in the same way. And if you can't reach the most vulnerable women, we could argue, through outreach, then how are you going to reach them? You might have the women who already know about women's open spaces and, and this word of mouth spreads, but I think women's open spaces are actually, because they've been there so long and they've built up these relationships, I think that they really do evidence best practice. Other organizations, I think, would struggle. Certainly lots of organizations have a, a kind of a really solid relationship with women, but it becomes much more difficult to access sex workers if they move the door. And it also makes sex work more secret, so it's harder to reach the most vulnerable women. There's a concern that the Swedish model may increase stigmatization. And certainly this is something that you can see, I think, with um, Ava Caradona who was speaking about Swedish um, sex workers, and actually they feel more frightened to talk about their position as sex workers within Sweden and within the UK. Um, and the most common and perhaps most serious complaint is that since the Sex Purchase Act in Sweden came in, they, sex workers have felt increasingly stigmatized. They don't feel respected. They don't feel like full members of society. And in particular, sex workers object to the fact that they were not consulted in the making of the law. I think that's an important point. But if we think about powerlessness, if we think about women who sell sex as victims, that they're weak and exploited, this kind of exploits the stereotypical understanding of what we have as sex workers. And I think we can see from Catherine and from Ava Caradona's talk this morning that not all sex workers feel like victims, and that some individuals who have particular stories might feel like the sex industry 
is problematic, that this isn't indicative of how all sex workers feel. And we have to listen to other voices. So for a group of women, the street-based sex workers that we spoke to, that are already marginalized and already stigmatized, and they highlight this marginalization and stigmatization as a key issue in terms of their ability to engage with society, as a key issue in terms of them being able to negotiate their mental health, if, we, if there's even the slightest concern that the Swedish model might increase their stigmatization, we can ask, is it worth it? If we're looking at a very vulnerable group of people, further stigmatizing them and further marginalizing them can have a really detrimental impact, and that's something that we need to think about really carefully. Um, there's, a, there's a concern that the Swedish model might mean that street by sex workers have less trust in authorities, Less trust in the police, if that's possible. Less trust in uh, a number of services that might be able to help them, and it might prevent them from seeking services. Um, important accusers say outreach work, provision of condoms, needle exchange, and primary care for a population rarely registered with a GP could be compromised if the strategies of forced and sex workers become reluctant to seek help. And they're talking specifically about the Swedish model here. Without access to specialist fast-track services for sexual health, sex workers may face delays in receiving treatment for sexually transmitted infections, which could have profound consequences for the sex workers. So there is a genuine concern that this particular model might have an impact on women's ability to access services. And I think it was really clear from the, from the conversations that we had both with the WAS team and with the sex workers that actually they really need these services, whether it's housing services, health <laughs> services, counseling services, these were all really important to them and, and brought them some stability at points. So if they weren't able to access these services, it would be hugely problematic. Um, and I think any legislation, any legislation that has the possibility of making it difficult for women to access services, I think again we have to ask, is this legislation that we really want? Is this legislation that's going to help the most vulnerable people? in a way that we think is appropriate. I'm just not sure the Swedish model is the right model. Um, and I think we can see we can see really clearly from the talks this morning, but also really clearly from the talks that we had to sex workers, that police are not seen as a source of protection. That they're not seen as a source that women can go to if they've been raped, if they've been if they've experienced violence from the planet, if they're having problems. There is a concern that the Swedish model would increase this problem. And I think we're already not dealing with that particularly well at the minute. Do we really want to introduce legislation that might make that even more difficult? Um, so there is also a concern that um, the report on the Swedish model suggested that there might be increased dependency on pimps. Uh, or a third party in order to negotiate the transaction because <coughs> men won't be on the streets curb calling, men will be criminalized, so having a third party who can guarantee some kind of safety or anonymity is something that's been seen as a result of the, the sort of Swedish um, model in Sweden. And again, most of the women that we spoke to, not all of them, how you understand <coughs> or sort of third party control I think is quite difficult, but for a lot of the women that we spoke to, they felt that they'd independently chosen to work in the sex industry. They didn't have to rely on somebody to negotiate uh, the amount of money that they would charge a client. They didn't have to rely on somebody to negotiate their transactions. So actually moving to a model where introducing a third party might come back into the equation isn't really a step forward. The point McCusick argue again that curb crawling will be policed in established with other areas despite strong evidence that this will simply displace sex work to other locations. This will also reduce sex workers' negotiating power, making it harder for them to find clients, increase their time on the streets, and force them to solicit more directly, increasing the risk of causing offense or distress to people not looking for paid sex. These conditions are directly linked to increased violence, pressure to advance safer sex practices, and increased public disorder, including vigilante attacks. So you can see this was the case in Ipswich, certainly. Um, and I think even at this point, even in 2012, when we were speaking to sex workers, the criminalization policy is not committed. But you could already see, with the targeting of, of curb crawlers in this area, with the targeting of male clients, actually women were already facing these problems. Introducing this model full scale, I think, would have huge implications, not for, just for sex workers in this area, but for street-based sex workers more generally. Um, 
So I think this links into some wider discussion that we've been having. And certainly, for those of you that aren't aware, in the last few weeks and months, there's been an increased focus <coughs> on what path the UK should take in terms of addressing prostitution. And a criminalization agenda, criminalization model, seems to be based mostly on a Swedish model of controlling prostitution, of removing sex workers from the street, getting them out of prostitution. And we can, we can, I think we have to think critically about the implications of using this particular model and what the ramifications might be. And I think Ava Caradonna and Catherine Stevens talked really eloquently about their experiences and, and the experiences of indoor sex workers. But for the, the, the women that we spoke to in this particular situation, I think if I, if I think through the Swedish model and how it might affect them, there's some really negative outcomes. And I'm not sure it would make them safer. I'm not sure it would get them to exit sex work. I'm not sure it would have any real positive benefits on them. And so I think that we need to think about the Swedish style model about criminalization and how it affects women in different kind of levels of sex work as well. Because at the minute, if you look at some of the discourses around prostitution, prostitution is a monolithic. But actually, women who work indoor may have very different experiences from women who work outdoor. And one model is not necessarily going to fit all. We have to think really carefully about the ramifications of using this particular style in terms of safeguarding some of the most vulnerable women who are working in sex work. Um, I also agree that the application of the law to this kind of, uh, to this is, is complicated, problematic, and be, um, can be counterproductive. So a resort to the law is not necessarily um, the road that we should be going down, or not the only road that we should be going down. Um, but I would like to return to the idea that um, the women, uh, the idea of consent and choice, that women consent to become prostitutes and the contractual notion of it. I know, I think her name is Erin, I came in late, so I hope I got that right. Um, you talked about the particular project that you were on and that you couldn't speak for any other um, group of women. You did say that. But on the other hand, you continually resorted to a uh, 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 discourse of vulnerable women in general, that women who go into prostitution are vulnerable. So um, my own way of approaching this is to think we, we don't automatically go down the route of the law. What we need to do is change um, ideas, values, and so on in our society. And the only way that we can do that is to connect prostitution, vulnerability, to the larger structures in which women feel that they are consenting to earning their money through the sexual contract uh, of providing sexual services. So until we look at larger social structures, economic ones for women, patriarchal social structures, and take all of those aspects into account, which I think we slightly missed out, we slightly missed out the Swedish model. The Swedish model is at least, if it isn't perfect, what it is doing is addressing those issues. I find it um, essential that we bring the large social structure in so that vulnerable women, the consent of vulnerable women is put into that context. Now, I know that there will always be Voices of people who can say, well, they feel that they're fully in control of what they say to that. We can bring individuals in who feel like that. But the broader issue, as you yourself have pointed out, is actually a structural one where women who enter the institution are very vulnerable. I, I just I think, think I've got one more point, I, I and then you can come back to me. I think uh, that's a really key to I've got one more point, I think you can come back with me. I've got one more point, thank you. Um, I regard myself as being sex positive. 
Um, absolutely. And I would like to hear that the choices that women make are about really sex positive behaviour. And um, the, the larger context in which you did talk about vulnerability, prostitution as emerging from as a vulnerability uh, for the position of women. Um, I would like to hear how that can be possibly seen as sex positive rather than the use of sex, actually, which to me seems sex negative. And this is not to make any moral judgment at all. Can I just say, I didn't say that women aren't in prostitution are vulnerable. I said actually the legal frameworks and, and actually the lack of rights that they have makes them vulnerable. There's nothing intrinsic about sex work that increases their vulnerability. It's only a legal framework, a lack of legal framework, and a lack of protection that makes them vulnerable. In terms of your other point, I, I actually think it's much more appropriate for, I know Catherine has a hand up, and I don't know if there are any other sex work activists who'd like to speak to those points, because to a certain extent, I'm only reflecting what, what the sex workers that I spoke to said. I think it's far more appropriate for sex workers to be able to come back and, and respond to that point. Catherine, do you yeah. want to? Um, yeah, in terms of the vulnerability of women in the sex industry, I'd absolutely agree. I'd really like to see that put. One of the things I didn't have time to talk about, and I think possibly you missed when I was speaking, uh, I didn't have time to talk about putting violence against women in the sex industry in a context that uh, of violence against women generally. Women in our society are vulnerable. Where I am vulnerable on the street, I am vulnerable in my home, I am vulnerable on the tube, I am vulnerable in the office. Women in the, this society are vulnerable, as are men. There's also a huge lot of amount of violence targeted at men. In terms of violence against people in the workplace, I contrast it with the levels of violence against people in any departments. Uh, the RCN has done repeated studies of thousands of nurses across the UK that have revealed about 85% of people working in A&E experience violence or abuse at work. Now, the response to that is not to prevent women from becoming nurses. The idea that the only place for a woman is at home, wrapped in cotton wool, duct taped to the sofa so she can't fall off. <laughs> it's actually it's about tackling violence within our society and treating all women with respect, regardless of our sexual behaviour, whether we're nuns, whether we're sluts, whether we're mothers, whether we're celibate, whatever we do. And so, absolutely, let's look at targeting violence, let's look at having a real and honest conversation about violence that tackles the kind of structural and systemic issues that both the sex worker activists spoke about earlier and that Erin has brought up, kind of, that's conveyed very eloquently in the study of a particular area of sex work, geographically and kind of economically in London today. And, and certainly I think that there are wider structural issues that we need to address, and that the, the kind of what I hope is the, the dying out of a, a particular form of capitalism. And actually social principles that used to guide feminism have largely gone to the side in terms of in terms of the, the emergence of identity politics, and I don't think that's particularly helpful. So I think we should be having wider discussions about the welfare state, and actually how, you know, if, if women are choosing sex work because of poverty, then how do we address poverty? Criminalizing clients is not a legitimate way to deal with that issue. If you want to talk about poverty, then let's talk about poverty. Great, let's not talk about criminalizing clients as a way to end prostitution, and poverty is at the root of what you think the issue is. Um, any other questions? Just one more before we go for lunch. Sorry, can you speak up a bit, please? Sorry, I just wanted to ask Erin about the extent of consent. Because can be a consensual, consensual relationship on a one by one case, but uh, how many have really chosen to accept the situation, even if it's out of poverty? 
Do any sex worker activists want to? I couldn't hear. I could hear the word consent. I think, I think a couple of the speakers have mentioned uh, consent existing within a... It doesn't happen in a vacuum, and all consent is constrained. Um, I don't know what you do for a living, but I don't think any people in this room would get up to go to their work if they weren't being paid. So everybody's <laughs> consent is squashed by economic coercion, and everybody coerces themselves to work. It's only sex workers that have this, this question of consent levels of them constantly. Like, there has to be pure choice. Like, sex workers would do it voluntarily if they weren't getting paid. Many people, like migrants, for instance, are considered unable to decide that they want to move to another country to engage in sex work uh, with gradations of consent. They know that they might have to pay off a debt, they might have to work for a third party. There is no, there is no real consent for any of us under capitalism. Uh, but that the question of capitalism just goes straight out the window when people want to talk about why women are doing a particular sexual activity for money. You know, it's it's a red herring, basically. Mm -hmm.